You are here, Lord. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. Yes, Lord. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. Yes, don't we worship you, Lord. I worship, I worship you. You are here and you're mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are. You are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is. Here we go. 
I'm just going to pray. We're going to get into a new series today. I'm excited to be kicking off our first series of the year. So let's just pray today as we get into God's Word. So thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for what you're going to do in our midst and the things you're going to teach us. I thank you for the leading of your Holy Spirit, God. And we are so dependent upon you to lead and guide us into what the truths are in your word that we desperately need today. And so I pray that you would do what you do best, God, and just lead and guide us into your truth. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I spent a great deal of time just kind of praying and wrestling over what our first series of the year should be. And uh, the one thing that just kept coming back to my mind and heart is the word overflow. And overflow was a big deal. One of the reasons why I think that uh, this word kept hitting me is as I look all around the landscape of Christians, what, what I kind of see is that a majority of us are really running on a sense of being very dry right now in the season. I see a lot of people who are running on fumes <laughs> and, and you just kind of feel like, am I going to keep making it in life right now? And it makes sense really, because if we look around, though it's taken place over the last couple of years, the demands of life have increased, they haven't decreased, they haven't gotten easier. One of, the, one of the challenges we face in our spiritual lives is when, you know, the demands are increasing, how do we continue to grow spiritually in the midst of those trying times and those seasons? And so I want us to seriously to contemplate a question as we get into this series. Listen, I made it multiple choice, so it's really easy for you uh, <laughs> uh, just to pick one. I don't want you to answer out loud. I really want you to contemplate about your life personally. And if you have a pen or a paper, write it down, okay? Write down where you think. And let me just say this also. By the end of the message today, you might actually shift your answer, and that's okay. Uh, but, but just, I want you really contemplating this as we get into today. Do you find yourself in a season going backwards spiritually or barely maintaining or growing? See, multiple choice, one of those three. You're either going backwards maybe, you're barely maintaining or you're growing. My guess is, is that too few of us even in this room would say we're really growing right now in this season. Now, some of you might be there and that's wonderful because this series will help you continue to grow. But I, I would guess that many of us are feeling like we're barely maintaining just where we've been. And that's, that's your assessment. Some of you are just brutally honest with yourself and you're like, you know what? <laughs> I just know that somehow I'm, I've gone backwards, like I'm not where I even used to be, and that's, uh, that's where you're at in life. What I find is that most of us, really, we just kind of end up going with the flow with life. And when you go with the flow in life, what you really find out is that you're not taking inventory of where you really are at. You're just kind of coasting, right? And so you, you coast, and the, the problem is, is that you don't realize that you're in trouble until you're too far into trouble to kind of feel like you can turn around. And then it's too hard to get back to where you used to be. And so I've seen this so many times in marriages, right? You know, you see this. People are trudging through their lives. They're busy. They're, they're really doing all the things that they need to do. And they're really just getting to a spot where they're in the flow of things. But they don't even realize that because they're not assessing their marriages, that they're drifting apart from one another. And all of a sudden they wake up one day and they feel like miles apart. And this happens so often in ministry, I see this. And what's interesting is, is that they don't even hate their spouse. They just not, they're connected to each other anymore. And they decide many times not to do life together anymore. 
Why? Because it's too hard to get back to where they used to be. And what's sad is that so often this could have been avoided if there was taking assessments or inventory going on in our lives of where we're at, what's really going on, and they just made adjustments along the way. Well, listen, I think the same thing happens in our spiritual lives. That really we just kind of coast and we don't even realize like we're so far drifting from God. We don't even hate God. It's just that like we wake up one day and we realize what I used to have with God is so far from where I'm at right now. And many people just throw in the towel because it's too hard to get back to that or they feel that way. And so this series is intended to help us take inventory before we drift too far from God. And we, we decide to throw in the towel. It's also meant to help us really enjoy the life that God has actually called us to live and go through in this life because there, there's a really a sweet spot that we can learn to live in. And so what does all that have to do with overflow? Well, overflow is a spiritual concept that throughout scriptures, if you look up the word overflow, you're going to see many, many scripture verses that deal with it. And really the Bible uses this term to teach us what it actually means to live life with God. God and how we are to live that life with God. And so we're going to really uncover those things because I think it's really important and it's something that's more difficult to just cover in one message. So we're going to go through at least five messages in this series of, over, of learning what it means to walk in the overflow of God and, and dealing with the overflow. Listen, throughout my life, I've learned the importance of living in the overflow. A uh, big part of it is because I actually, uh, I actually really got close to burnout many times. And so I wasn't living in the overflow. And, and so I learned that that wasn't fun. <laughs> so I needed to make adjustments along the way so I wouldn't get into these overflow or burnout times. In my 20s, I probably got to burnout about three different times in my life. And really the reason for it was because I was giving out more than I was taking in. And that's where so many of us find. And so we, we end up what, we, we look around and, and this might describe your life right now. You're giving way more than you're taking in and you're, what you end up doing is, is you burn up all your reserves. You know what would happen if you got in your car and you just kept driving until it went empty? <laughs> Eventually it would stall, right? <laughs> and you wouldn't be going anywhere anymore. And we don't realize that we do the same thing often with our lives. Listen, God actually wants us to be filled up every day with him. And he actually wants us to be more than just filled up, but he wants us to be spilling over with him in our lives. And listen, it's that spillover that is meant to spill over onto others and to be what encourages those around us. But what happens for most of us is we're not being filled up with God, and so what are we using? We're using our reserves to fill others with. And what often happens is, is we get to a spot where we're worn out or we run out of gas. And you know what? We're so crazy that we just get out and start pushing the car <laughs> and wearing ourselves out more. Like, why is life so hard? We don't stop to fill up. We just start pushing that car. And that's not where God wants us to live. And so the challenge is, uh, for us is how do we get to that spillover stage going on in our lives on this daily basis? That's what I want us to talk about throughout this whole series is how do we live in the spillover? How do we live in the overflow? And there's, again, many aspects to that. Today we're going to deal, though, with really this assessment stage. Okay, we're, we're going to, I know the assessment is never as fun as, is learning how to live in the overflow, but we gotta start somewhere. We gotta assess what's going on in our lives because the truth is our lives are actually filled up with something. And there actually is an overflow and the Bible teaches this. And so what we need to start with is what is the overflow of our life right now before we can decide how we can live in the overflow that God has for our lives. And so this is what we're gonna look at today. So in the New Testament, fruit is talked about a whole lot. I mean, if you go through the New Testament, Jesus uses the analogy of trees and fruit all over the place. And really, it is, it, our lives are producing some kind of fruit. Whether you believe it or know it or not, your life is producing some kind of fruit. And that kind of fruit that your life is producing is directly connected to what's really going on in your life. Where is the roots, right? That's where it's really connected to. Our passage today is really often isolated from context. 
And, and you know, if you've been around here a lot, that is really dangerous because it gets you to misinterpret what, what is really being talked about here. And so I want to read our passage and I want to put it back into context. And so it's found in Matthew 12, 33. It says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for a tree is known by its fruit. When Jesus says this, let me give you the context of where he says it or how he says it in. He, he says this because Jesus had just healed a man who was demon-possessed. Not only was he demon-possessed, but he was blind and he couldn't talk. Okay, I want you to sit on here for a minute because I think we miss these details. Because put yourself in the story and, and watch what Jesus does here. Because here is this guy who is demon-possessed. That means he's literally out of his mind. Okay, there's demons controlling this guy. He can't see anything and he can't even talk. And everyone around this guy is afraid of this guy because quite frankly, the dude's crazy. <laughs> okay, that's who this guy is. And Jesus steps in and he heals this guy and changes his life. And all of a sudden, this guy goes from being crazy to sitting next to Jesus, having a conversation with him, being able to see all around him everything that's going on and in his right mind. And the crowd see this. Just a second ago, this man was crazy. Now he's, he's in his right mind. He can see, he's talking. And they go, well, this guy's gotta be like the son of David, the Messiah. They have to come to that conclusion. And so the Pharisees see all this going on and they're upset. Because they don't want anyone following Jesus and they're going to do everything they can to try to squash anybody following Jesus. And so the problem is, is they can't deny that Jesus did a miracle. And so what the Pharisees do is they try to redefine the miracle. Listen, this is what our culture does all the time, right? We see a miracle of a baby being born, right? So what do we do? We redefine that and call it a fetus. And then we kill that, right? That's what our... That's what our culture does. Or we look around and we see all of creation and the beauty of it and, and the wonders of it. And so they can't deny that this creation is wonderful and beautiful. So what do we do? We redefine it and say is, it all happened by chance. They try to take away the miracle of God because people hate God just like the Pharisees do. Listen, the Pharisees literally attribute the miracle that God just did, that Jesus did, did in front of them to Satan instead of God. They hated Jesus so much that they attributed this miracle to Satan. Look what it says in verses 26 through 28. If Satan drives out Satan, Jesus is responding to their accusation of him. He says, if Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will the kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Be Beelzebub, who is it your sons drive them out by? For this reason, they will be your judges. If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. So Jesus exposes their foolishness of thinking by challenging it. Okay, he challenges their line of thinking by, by bringing to them a question that they have to wrestle with. Hey, if your sons are driving out demons, who are they doing it by? Now listen, we don't know if literally their sons were casting out demons or if they were putting on shows and pretending like, hey, this person's a demon possessed and look what happens. And, you know, they set it up so that it looks like them. We don't know which one it is, and Jesus doesn't dispute one way or the other, but Jesus, he, he uses their logic, and he says, hey, if you're using, if your sons are doing this, who are they doing it in, in name of, right? And so they're, they're, they're doing this, and they're, he's using their logic against them. Now, I love the fact that Jesus doesn't just come up and say, hey, I'm the Messiah, follow me and believe me. What does Jesus do? He says, hey, if... What I just did was a miracle. Then the kingdom of God is upon you. I mean, think about how powerful that is. If you just saw a miracle in your presence, then the kingdom of God is right here. And I'm a representative of that kingdom. Listen, if you are witnessing, show the evidence of who Jesus is and let people decide. Give them that freedom to decide. If Jesus did that for himself, he just presented, hey, this is who I am. You see the evidence. Now you decide. 
then that's one of the greatest tools we can do in witnessing to somebody is just tell them the evidence and let them decide. This scenario leads into what is known as the unpardonable sin. In Matthew 12, 31, we read this, because of this I tell you, people will be forgiven every sin and blasphemy, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. You know, people always want to know, this always happens in theological circles or just questions that come from people in the body of Christ. Okay, well, what's the unpardonable sin? And it's, it's probably a good question because you probably don't want to do that one, right? <laughs> if you know that one can't be forgiven, let's avoid that one, okay? And, and so people always want to know. And I think we, we make it more difficult than it really is. Look at the context. The Pharisees have just attributed the work of God to Satan. They saw a man healed from a demon. They saw him healed from blindness. They see the guy talking and something that none of them could accomplish and do, and they gave Satan the credit. The context of the unpardonable sin is set up by what the Pharisees did, but it's explained by what Jesus teaches in our text today. A tree is known by its fruit. In other words, Jesus is not saying that their words sentenced them to hell, He's saying, your words just reveal that you're already headed there. That's what's going on in this passage. Because the Holy Spirit was the power behind the work and the ministry of Jesus and everything that he was doing, they're blaspheming his work. And so, because they're blaspheming, the reason they're blaspheming his work is Jesus makes no bones about it. Your father, Satan. Look what he says. He goes on to confront them in verse 34. Jesus goes on to say, Brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? When Jesus calls them this, he's literally saying, you're an offspring of the vipers. In other words, it's a picture back to the garden when Satan came to Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent. And he's literally calling them, you're a chip off the old block. Your father is Satan. That's who you serve, the serpent of old. And they had accused Jesus of having this demon inside of him to cast out other demons. And Jesus tells them, listen, you're doing the work of your father, the devil. The devil is constantly, what's he trying to do? Kill, steal, and destroy, right? And that's exactly what the Pharisees were trying to do to the work of God. Kill, steal, and destroy. The evidence, the fruit of their lives was that they were attacking the work of God. I just want to say, hey, Christians, or people who go to church, let's say it that way. I see this a lot. People who go to church who are angry with the church, they end up tearing down the work of God in their arguments, in their language, in their words, trying to act like they're Christians and they're the real ones, but what they're doing is they're trying to tear down. What's the fruit? The fruit is, is that you're trying to tear down the work of God. That's your, your father is... Satan. That's what he does. Every believer should be trying to build up the kingdom of God. And that's the fruit of a real believer. And so the, this, is the, the, this is the context of what we're going to be talking about today. And, and Jesus is saying, hey, a tree is known by its fruit. Now when he says that, listen, we often even misuse that, right? Because how do we use it? We use it to go, okay, well, what's the fruit of this person over here and the fruit of this person over here? And we use it to judge one another. Jesus isn't using it in that context. He's telling the Pharisees, hey, look at your fruit of your life. This is personal application right here. This is not look around at everyone else and judge their fruit. This is judge my fruit. What is the fruit of my life? The problem with the Pharisees is that they always took the principles of God and they applied it to everyone around them but themselves. They were good at doing this. This is what so many of us are doing, right? We, we look at the principles of God, we know the scripture verses, and we're really good at saying, hey, you need to be doing this in your life, right? We apply it to everyone else but ourselves. And what we realize or may not realize is we're being just like the Pharisees. And Jesus is challenging us to judge ourselves. That's what he's doing in this passage. So how do we judge the fruit of our lives? Well, there's a little bit of a twist here as well because judging the fruit of our lives is not often what we normally think of. Look what it says again in 34, Matthew 12, 34 through 35. It says, For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. 
A good man produces good things from his storeroom of good, and an evil man produces evil things from the storeroom of evil. Listen, when we normally think of judging fruit and the fruit of our lives, what we normally think of is judging our actions, right? And Jesus says, don't do that. The fruit of your life is found in your words. I think it's bigger, this is a bigger deal to realize what's going on here than most of us make of it. That little shift to not just our actions, but our words. And the reason is, is listen, we tend to see the good and miss the bad in our lives. When we look at the landscape of our lives, most of us, we tend to look at all the good in our lives and dismiss all the bad. We let ourselves off the hook. Now, in other people, what do we see? We see all the bad in their lives and we, we, we just overlook the good that they do. We're really good at that in other people. But for us, we let ourselves off the hook on the bad. Or we kind of average out the good versus the bad, right? And what do most of us come, we come on the side of generally I'm good, right? So we, we do that. The point is, is that we, when we look at the fruit of our lives, we almost always see good fruit. That's just the way it is. And the Pharisees, if they were judging themselves by their actions, guess what they would see? Good fruit. They were meticulous at keeping the law. They were really good at keeping the letter of the law. And they, that's how they lived their lives. And so they would have looked at the fruit of their lives and said, oh, we're good. This subtle shift of fruit being to our words and not our actions is actually a big deal because we need to explore what's going on in our words because there's something that's really important here, how it reveals what's really going on in our hearts. But I want to point out one more key piece to this. We're talking today about the overflow, right? It is the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Some translations say abundance. So Jesus is not talking about the occasional slip up that we might have with our words. I mean, those are important still. Slip ups, we don't get off the hook for slip ups, but Jesus is really drilling down on what's the overflow of your heart? What is the general consensus of the words coming out of your mouth? that is exposing our hearts. I, I think that distinction is important because James says it this way in James 3, 2, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man able to bridle the whole bi body. And we know none of us in this room is perfect, right? <laughs> we all know the moments when we say something and, and you kind of just immediately wince. <clears throat> Wish I didn't say that word, right? We just had that moment. And so we know we are far from perfect. Our words expose that. But let me spend some time talking about the overflow because it has huge implications on our lives. Our words reveal what's going on in our hearts. Do you know that? And so the big question is, is have you listened? Have you just stopped and take inventory and listen to the words that are coming out of your mouth? Because most of the time, I don't think we do. If what is coming out of your mouth is really what's going on in your hearts, then this is something really important that we can use to learn where we really are at in life. This is why your answer might change from when we started. Let me just set this up by sharing something really easy that puts us in context, okay? Because we're all going through this. Everyone's talking about what? COVID, right? <laughs> you can't get away from it. Someone sneezes and you're like, there's COVID over there, right? <laughs> Or you get a headache and the first thing you do is, is go get that thermometer because I got to see if I got a temperature because I think I'm coming down with some COVID right now, right? And so you, you're always consumed with this idea of COVID. No matter what side of the aisle you are um, with being vaccinated, you can't get away from the connection of vaccinations to COVID, right? Because either you have to be vaccinated to work or you have to get tested to work for most of you. You can't get away from it. And now you're reminded, even if you try to go out to eat, am I vaccinated or not? Can I eat in the restaurant or do I have to go home, right? It's only takeout for us if we're not. And so we can't stop thinking about COVID. And it is dominating our lives, and if we're honest, in negative ways. We're much more afraid of life than we used to be. Constantly thinking about sickness. Most of us didn't... Think about sickness 24-7, but now we are. Am I sick? Am I going to get someone else sick? What's going on? You know, my nose ran. Oh, you're just outside and it's cold. That normally happens, but you think I'm getting sick, right? And we're much more negative to each other, right? 
You know, you look at each other a little funny now. <laughs> and you didn't used to. But listen, you know what it is? This is the fruit of constantly being bombarded with COVID. And in many ways, we can't help it because we're inundated with COVID messages day in and day out. Now, that's just to get us started, to show you how it works. The overflow is just happening because the messages keep going in, right? That message, message. The overflow is we can't stop talking about it. And you want to stop talking about it, and we even have conversations. Let's stop talking about it. But next thing you know it, five minutes later, what are you back to talking about? COVID. Because somebody always got to bring it up in the room, right? <laughs> now that's just, again, to, to get us really priming the pump because there's other areas of our lives where we can see how the overflow needs to work. And so we need to take inventory of really what's going on in our lives. Let me turn our attention to a few other examples. If you were to listen to yourself as you talk and have a conversation with other people, what would you hear? Would you hear pride? I mean, most of us would probably say, I'm not that prideful. But if you probably listen to your conversations with other people, you might find that, guess what? I talk a whole lot about myself. And if you're talking a whole lot about yourself and not listening to the other person, you know what? There's pride there. Or maybe, maybe what you would hear is gossip. Maybe you don't talk about yourself, but all you do is talk about that other person and what they're doing and that person over there and what they're doing and that person over there. And, and what you would actually see is if you listen to your words, you would see, I gossip a lot. And you never knew that before, but you started taking inventory. Or maybe it's slander. Maybe you're constantly putting down some people around you, and there's always these slanderous words coming out of our mouths. Maybe for you it's different. If you listen to your words, maybe for you, what you're going to find out is, man, I spend an awful lot of time complaining. <laughs> I complain about my job, I complain about my spouse, I complain about my kids, I complain about the economy, the government. You just go on and on. And all you do is complain, complain, complain. Or maybe, maybe it's just talking about problems. How often do you just swear words pop out of your mouth? I mean, again, be honest with yourself. How often does just a bad joke come up? I know these are kind of the negative side of things, but if many of us are honest, we would find that there's a whole bunch of bad things that are really coming out of our mouths that we let ourselves off a hook for, and, and we think, well, uh, I just occasionally tell a bad joke, or I just occasionally might say something bad, but, but if it's flowing out all the time, you know what's really going on? This is who you are. And it's really important to know that this is who you are because Scripture makes it very clear, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, when you follow desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Listen, I think it's really telling that so often, what do we do? We, we point to the things like, oh, sexual sin, there's a bad one. You're going to go to hell if you're doing that. Or getting drunk, keep getting drunk, guess what? You're headed to hell or going to wild parties. We, we'll harp on that, but we'll give ourselves a pass on things like quarreling. Or we give ourselves a, a pass on jealousy that is festering in our lives. Or we give ourselves a pass on being selfishly motivated. I'm just trying to get ahead, but really you're selfishly motivated. Or being the person in the room that constantly causes a problem. Everywhere you go, you cause a problem. You're causing dissension. Listen, the latter list is often revealed in our words, but listen, they're just as dangerous because they point out what's going on in our hearts. That we're filled with these things. And those are taking us away from, what, the kingdom of God. Now here's the deal. Taking inventory can actually help us in pursuing Jesus. We get the false notion out of our head that, you know what, I'm closer to God than I really think I am. 
And so it really opens up our, our eyes. It's not just negative. It can be very positive as well in our lives. But let me just kind of give you another few assessments. Here's a big one. When you're talking to others, do your words ever point to God in the Bible? I mean, think about this. We're really good at probably talking and shooting the breeze about what's going on in sports or what's going on in the weather or that COVID thing again. <laughs> We're really good at talking about that. But do we ever talk about God in the Bible? Does that ever just spill out? Because listen, if God in the Bible isn't spilling out, guess what that means? You're not filled up with God in the Bible. You have this illusion of being close with God, but you're really not. Because if you were, it would just be spilling out of our lives. And so this is actually a better assessment of where we're at with God than our actions. Because let's be honest, we can even feel good about our church attendance. I made it to church. I only missed two times this year. I know so-and-so who missed, like, they maybe made it once a month, so I'm better than them, right? And so we start looking at our actions, or I help people out, and I do nice things, but our words give us a way that maybe we're not always as close to God as we're claiming to be. And so there's this invitation in our words when we look at them to get closer to God, Finally, listen to yourself pray sometime. You ever just looked at your prayers? Again, I challenge you sometimes just to prayer journal. Write down your prayers. You realize like how it, it'll help you stay focused, but you can go back and read it then. And what you might find out is so often your prayers are focused on yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying for yourself. We know that, but... If that's all you're praying for and you're not praying for other things, you're a little out of balance. Or when was the last time you just, just got in God's presence to just praise him and worship him and not ask him for anything? Or when was the last time your prayer time was f focused on everyone else and you didn't even make a request for yourself? See, what we end up finding is that many times there's room for us to grow in even how we pray and how we talk to God. In fact, if you really look at the example Jesus gave us in the Lord's Prayer in teaching us how to pray, what do we see? We see, we see that the very first thing we do is we focus on God and how great and holy He is. We do that long before we even ask Him to meet our needs or to guide our lives in any way, shape, or form. We do talk about that, but it's in the middle. And then what do we what do we do? We also have this little thing that we want to skip over. Nobody wants to talk about the forgive others as I have forgiven them or forgive me, Jesus, as I forgive other people, right? <laughs> I don't want that part, God. Just forgive me, but forgive somebody else. But then what does it do? It ends with how great God is. And that's what Jesus taught us to pray. And so when you take inventory of your words, what is, what is flowing out? What is it that you see? Some of us might not, again, find we're not as close to God as we thought we were. Some of us will find we drifted a lot further than we really thought we've drifted. And some of us, we, we really might see the, the good news is that, hey, I am overflowing with the things of God. And what I found is, is those that find they're overflowing with the things of God, you just want more of that. You're not boastful or proud of that. You just, you want more. Jesus ends a section by bringing us back to judgment, specifically the judgment of our words, because it reveals what's going on in our hearts. Look what it says in verse 36 through 37. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. The word careless means inactive, idle, or worthless. It's the same word that is used in James 2.20. In James 2.20, he says this, foolish man, are you, willing to learn, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Listen, it's the, careless, it's the idea that careless words are useless words. See, when we think of it, I think most of the time we think the words that are going to be judged are the words that are abusive, not useless. But in many ways, our words are deceptive, right? We say the right things, we sound spiritual, but we're really not. James even says this in his, the way he writes. He says, listen, we, we often say nice things to people. Hey, you have a need. I pray that God blesses that. 
But we have the ability to meet that need, but we send them on their way without helping them out. In essence, he says, your faith is dead because your words give it away. You can't just say nice things and not do anything because faith without works is dead. Jesus is really saying the same thing here. We often say all kinds of good things, but is there fruit on our tree that shows that we have a, a live faith? Or does it prove that our faith is really dead? In Matthew 7, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of the Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? In other words, didn't we do all these good things? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. See, you can do all of these good things, but if your heart's not right, they mean nothing. You're not connected to God. The Bible is very clear how we're saved, and so I want to make it very clear. It's not saying that by our words we're saved or by our words we're really condemned. The Bible says we're saved this way, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. We're saved by grace through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. Our salvation is a gift, and it's simply something we receive, but our words, they reveal if we've received that gift or not. The words that show we have been justified are simply this. Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's the person who is called upon God who is saved and has received his grace. So today as we close, I want to look back at this key verse that we looked at. Matthew 12, 34, it says, for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. I think the starting point for us in this series and for today is really for us to see what's in our hearts and to be brutally honest about it. We need to remember what the Bible teaches about our hearts. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That has been one of the main points today. We're easily deceived. We easily think we're better off than we really are, but our heart reveals what's really going on inside of our lives and where we're really at with God. And that's why in some ways today might be a little bit difficult because we walk away realizing hey, I, I'm further drifting away from God than I realized that before I walked out of here. But don't be discouraged because the point is, is that when we recognize where we're at, then we know we need to go to the heart changer. We need to go to Jesus. Jeremiah reminds us of the work that God does in us also. He says this in Jeremiah 31, 33, but this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. When you and I enter a covenant with God, he does the work. He writes it into our hearts. He gives us this new mind. He gives us a new heart. It doesn't mean, though, that you and I can just coast. We have a part to play in making sure the right things are going in so that the right things are flowing out. One major key is to be constantly letting the Word of God diagnose our hearts. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your heart is in big trouble without a constant flow of the Word of God going in. And there are no substitutes to this. I mean, I wish, in some ways, I wish there was because, you know, I mean, I know so many people aren't reading their Bible and I wish I could say, well, if you, you, you could just, this could be your backup, but there isn't. You have to be in His Word. I don't care if you're listening to it on your phone or you're reading it, you've got to be putting the Word of God into your life. There's absolutely no way for you to be filling your life with God if you're not in His Word. Finally, we also need to pray about our hearts. David says this in Psalm 139, 23 through 24. I pray this often. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and see if there's any anxious thoughts in me. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. 
we, we got to pray, God, that you would just search me and, and reveal those areas of my heart that just aren't right. And we're constantly going before God and letting his light search us. And, and really to sum it all up, you know, the, the way of getting in the overflow is just more of Jesus. It really is. I mean, there's always the answer, right, Jesus? But it, it, just immersing yourself more and more in Jesus, and that is what's going to start coming out in your life, and that's where we're meant to live. And we're going to continue to, to really walk through this next week. We're going to talk about living in the overflow and, and how we live in that. And, but, but I think this week, as we, as we really lay our hearts bare, as we really assess our hearts before God and really take inventory, I mean, maybe you need to take a day tomorrow and just start going, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for the next half a day or the next full day, I'm gonna really going to take note what's coming out of my mouth. When I get a phone call, I'm going like, to listen to myself, not just talk, but what am I really saying? You know, and then, you know, here's what's going to happen. You're going to catch yourself and you're probably not going to say what you would have, but you're going to know you thought it <laughs> and you were just catching yourself. But those are the things that God is going to reveal in our lives of going, hey, what's really here is not, you're not as far as you thought you were. You're not as good as you think you are. And you need more of me. And hopefully that's an invitation that just drives you to pressing into God more and more because he wants to fill our lives with more of him. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word and I thank you. I thank you that you have, Lord, a filling for each of and every one of us, God. And you want us to live in the overflow of you, Jesus. God, today as we begin this series, we are really checking ourselves and seeing what's coming out, God. And Lord, I pray that this is not a depressing thing at all as much as it is a wake-up call to really press more into you, Jesus. To realize that maybe we're not as good as we thought we were. Jesus, the only reason why you show us those things is so that we see there's way more than what we've been experiencing. And so I pray today's encouraging. Lord, I pray for those that walked in today, God. And Lord, as, as we began this series, we talked about how many of us are just running on fumes, Lord. We're worn out. And it's really because we're giving way more than we're receiving. God, again, there's no other way that we can be filled up than to just simply be in your word, God allowing your word to fill us anew. And so I pray for wisdom this week. There are many people that, Lord, they look at their schedules and there's just no more time to squeeze anything in. But God, may, may you just give creativity and wisdom in, in doing it, God. Maybe, again, for some, it's to listen to the Bible on their commute. Maybe for others, it is going to be sacrificing sleep just to get up a few minutes earlier, God. Lord, there is ways that we can expose ourselves to your word. And Lord, if, if what we see coming out is not what we like or what we had hoped, God, may we be willing to pay whatever price it is to fill us with the things of you, God. And so I pray for your grace and your mercy to cover us today. We thank you for it, God. Listen, if you're in this room, before we go into a time of communion, I just want to ask you, maybe, maybe Jesus isn't your Lord and Savior. And you just realize that there's so many things that are in your life that have, are indications that you are not right with God. Uh, there's amazing thing is, is Jesus again invites us into a covenant with him to be our Lord and be our Savior and that if we would just humbly call out to him he promises to save us and give us a new heart and a new life in him 
And if that's you today and you want that, could I just lead you in a prayer today where you're at to just receive Jesus into your life? Just between you and God, would you pray? Pray with me. Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I thank you that you are a God who loves. You are a God who is willing to expose our hearts and to show us who we really are. Because God, it's in finally seeing who we really are that we realize just how much we need you. So Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And you said if I would call upon your name, I would be saved. So I pray, Lord, would you save me? Would you give me a new mind and a new heart in you, Jesus? And from this day forward, I want to live and honor you with all of my life. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that, tell somebody before you leave. And we'd love to get you a Bible and some next steps in following Christ. So don't rush out of here uh, without telling somebody if you, if you prayed that prayer. Oh, it's time to move. 
our faith, Jesus. Spirit sound. Spirit sound. Rushing wind. Fire of God. Fall within. Holy Ghost. Breathe on us, we pray. Revival fire, the whole breath of God, fans unto blame. We need, we need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. Pour your spirit out, pour your spirit out. We need a fresh wind, the fragrance of heaven. For hearts that burn with holy fear, purify the faith and deep, refine us fire, strengthen what remains. Yes, Lord. So we, the church, who bear your light, lamp of flame, city lights, king and kingdom come, is what we pray. Holy anointing, the power of your presence, pour your spirit out, yes, Lord, pour your spirit out, 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 pour your spirit out. Yes, Lord, blow upon us, Lord. Amen. 
holy anointing, Lord, a holy anointing, the power of your presence, pour your spirit out, 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 pour your spirit out. The Bible says on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And after the supper, he lifted up the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's the blood that's been shed for you and for the forgiveness of your sins. Every time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Jesus, once again, we thank you. God, because you are the one that is working in us. And Lord, we're reminded every time we come to the table that God... This work that you're doing, Lord, it's you doing it in us. And we welcome that, God. And we pray that you would just continue to draw us to your heart and to your life, God. I thank you that, Lord, you paid the penalty for all sin on the cross, God. Lord, to make a way back to you in a relationship with you, God. And Lord, at the end of the day, all of these indications of our heart just shows us that there is still often distance between us and you, but you bridge that gap. And so I pray, Lord, that we would desire to be close to you with all of our hearts, Lord. And I thank you for the leading of your Holy Spirit again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let me pray a blessing and we'll dismiss and hopefully see you next week as we continue this series. So may the Lord bless you. May God keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God grant you his peace. Amen and God bless.